Federated Sony headphones at Federated. Many to choose from at Federated as low as 947 at Federated. Oh. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Federated. <laughs> But apparently everybody doesn't know, Red. Everybody knows. Absolutely. Guaranteed. Uh, Guaranteed. Guaranteed low prices. In writing. Yes, sir. If they find it for less within 30 days of purchase. Yes. So Federated refunds the difference, right? Plus 10% of the difference for the trouble day. And now a guaranteed low price on a Quasar VHS video cassette recorder 27311. We'll match any price in town. How could anyone possibly shop anywhere else? Someone in Ohio didn't. But we don't have a store there. So let me get this straight. We Federated match any price by anybody, right? Absolutely. Is that right? Is that right? <laughs> I, Fred Rated, will pierce the price on videotape. Watch this. <laughs> TDK T120 videotape at $5.99. Fuji T120 videotape, $5.99, less $1 manufacturer rebate. <laughs> and Sony L500 videotape at Uh, so, look, we didn't do last night because I was with Genesis. And, uh, yes, Phil Collins is sitting down. If you haven't seen my Instagram, Phil is sitting, and he's he's greatly diminished. And uh, and it, I'll tell you, the show is incredible. It's the sixth time I've seen Genesis, and I'm not a fan of them live. They're one of my top five bands, but uh, they really nailed it last night. I uh, Welcome. Welcome. This is the Lion's Den. I hope you knew that before you tuned in. This is where the angels and the devils fight. They're choosing up sides tonight. Me? I'm part man, part monkey, part mystery. And the angels and the devils are playing tug of war with my personality. Uh, a lot of people have taken credit for me uh, and lied. But I did have some influences. And uh, Stan Freeberg, uh, Dr. Demento, Firesign Theater, Monty Python, Benny Hill. Who? Stan Freeberg was a big one. Yeah. Uh, radio, who else? Uh Oh, uh, Alan Hunter on MTV, I thought was cool. Won't have sex with Martha Quinn. The rest of them I didn't care about. And uh, and and our guest tonight, who I've already I'm already humiliated by how rinky dink this operation is we're doing here. But uh, this really is just a lark. But I want to bring on. You saw his uh, some of his silliness. One of the greats and one of my heroes, the Shadow Shadow Stevens. And I can't hear him. Hey Shadow, I can't hear you. Okay, we can do it again. There we go. Shadow! Professional. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're you're shocked at how rinky dink this is, right? What we're doing? No, it isn't it isn't at all your rinky dinkness. It's uh it's a, a program you're using that is not my favorite. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, hey, we work with what we have. We make do because yes. we are a creative team. Shadow, where are you from? I am from North Dakota. Jamestown, wow. North Dakota. The cattle so, and the wheat and the folks that can't be beat. So uh, Jim Bohannon was another guy that I, I worked with and, and ran his show as a kid. I'm just thinking of people. Stern and uh, and Rush and others claim to have uh, been my inspiration, which was not true. Um, I, look, you had great hair, good looking guy. I didn't want to be these ugly other guys. I mean, you got the chicks. Stop, please stop. No, no, come on. Uh, and and your uh, Pete Lecoq, when I had when I did radio at Q one hundred four in Kansas City, Pete Lecoq uh, was a, a a Kansas City Royal. And he would do sports on our show, and his father was who the host of Hollywood Squares. Oh, really? Yeah. Which who am I thinking of? Who was the host of Hollywood Squares? John David. Peter Marshall. Okay, well, Peter Marshall. That's a long time ago. Is he still I, alive? I'm, I'm part of the of, of the John of the uh, John Davidson. Uh, is he still alive? He's still alive and still has more hair than you and I combined, and can still play the hell out of a guitar. And he's one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. Your hair was such a big part of of Shadow. You're famous for your great hair. Has it been a lot of pressure as you've gotten older? 
Uh, no, it's just a, you know, like it's gone through all kinds of iterations. <laughs> you know, that's the uh, that's the loose cannon era. Oh my God, the Dave's World era. Uh, oh, that's that's tracks. That's the movie I did. That, that was great. That's that's a pretty funny movie. That's uh, when I wrote my uh, children's book. I remember the kids' book. Um, what hap What happened to radio? What went wrong? Uh, well, the first thing that went wrong was consolidation, and then the uh, you know it got corporatized, and then all the stations own all the companies. A few companies owned all the stations, and all competition went out the window. So people didn't try to get better anymore, and they you know, tried to do things leaner and meaner and, you know, like with fewer people and with fewer talented people, because after all, it's just about the music mix. And, you know, we've got an upward flow where we're transitioning up it. We're up two tenths of a point from a 1.7 to a 1.9. And so we're showing uh, a lot of, uh, we're showing a lot of, you know, we're very optimistic about the future. Uh, people don't realize what, you know, I mean, that, that, that our wives would be so bored right now. This is radio, you know, this is radio geek talk, yeah. but, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's the hell that we live through. And I would go up one, one millionth of a point and it was champagne time and we would go down one, one millionth of a point and what's he doing wrong uh, and they got to change you and they got to take control and they got to hold you back because you really clearly don't know what you're doing. Otherwise, you would be up two tenths of a point instead of down one point. Uh, let's forget about the margin of error because, you know, there is such a thorough um, indoctrination into the methodology of um, of taking ratings. We went we went to Beltsville, Maryland, when I was program director of one of the stations and looked at the surveys horrifying it's one step off of you know child with a crayon it it was clearly they would just give the uh, books to their children and say fill these out for us and then get paid it was uh shocking yeah horrifying. yeah I, I i mean i was i was at a big radio conference i think in la you may have been there stern was there and rush was there and all the radio people were there and they announced consolidation. And I stood up and I said, and, and all these guys thought they were going to be huge. They're mm. going to be, they're going to be the next. And by the way, all these guys you and I talk about, including me and you, the biggest never gets talked about. Would we agree the real moneymaker in our lifetimes was Paul Harvey? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never hear about Paul Harvey that what? guy. And I knew him. I was friendly with him in Chicago. Oh, and, really? and, yeah. Uh, but that was the real deal. Where am I going with this? I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm I, just rolling with you. I, I stood up, I stood up and I said, excuse me, this is going to be a disaster. Sit down, shut the, sit down, Mueller, asshole, sit down. I was the only guy. I'm not, look, I'm not taking, I'm telling you when I got to Chicago shadow in 1994, there was just, and I'm not kidding, just shy of a hundred people that I could work for a hundred different people I could go to. Oh, you don't like it. See you later. I'll go number, I'll go be number one over here. Now right. there's three. Yeah. There's yeah, three people exactly that we right. can talk to in Chicago. Three. Or anywhere in the country. There's, you know, they, they own them all. And, and, and if you don't, that. and if you don't spew their pro look, I, I, this is this, you know, and you dealt with some of the same people, the same companies. And what people don't understand is, look, any kind of passion now in this era comes off as angry. And I've said it, if a black guy's angry, it's righteous. If a Mexican guy's angry, he's a hot headed Latino. If I if, if if I get mad, I'm just a dick. I'm okay with that. But you know, look, I'm not angry, and I want to make this clear. You own Cumulus or whatever company, and you you want whatever propaganda spewed. That's fine. That I didn't. I I said no, and I wouldn't do it anymore. But I'm not angry about it. Do you understand? Well, I totally understand, and, and you know, the politics of it all is why I left radio after creating three number one Los Angeles radio stations. When if I'm going to work this hard, I'm going to go up for higher stakes because this is bullshit. It's like I couldn't take it anymore. And then they drew me back in and I did American Top 40. And of course, it was gigantic and it was all over the world. There were oh my God. You know, a billion people listening every week. And, uh, and still there were games that were played. It, and the whole way it came apart was a game that someone played. Did it's you take over for Casey? 
I took over for Casey. Yeah, they they interviewed, they auditioned eleven hundred people, but the reason I got it is because I was kind of the Ryan Seacrest of the moment. I was big on television from Hollywood Squares and yeah. Chuck Davidson and the gang. Why? Uh, can, a stupid question. Why was I a fan? Uh, charisma, uh, wit, um, attitude. You. <laughs> you you were uh, you know look we're we're sitting here it's been a few years but uh, 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 and I'm not gay I'm not headed that way and I don't care if I, you know I, I don't care but you were a good looking guy great hair great sense of humor you got the girl uh, I never wanted to be one of these fat ass Steve Dahl uh, you know radio fat pukes uh, I didn't admire them you. Well, I, I made it out of radio and then made it back to radio and then made it out of radio again, just in time for the consolidation. And uh, I almost went back and I had I was I was I was ash, actually asked to go to K-Earth here in Los Angeles to do uh, oldies radio. And the program director at the time said, yeah, no, it's just a matter of protocol. Just give me some stuff. So we just we just need a demo. We just need a demo. All right. OK. So I got a demo. I put together a demo that had Jay Leno, George Carlin, who never did it for anyone else in his whole career. It had Dick Clark. It had the Pointer Sisters singing Welcome Back to Radio. It had everything. It had a game. It had, it had comedy. It, it had everything. And then I packaged it with all the artwork I did of contests and promotions we could do. And I gave it to him. And I didn't hear back from him for three months. And when I heard back, he said, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry that uh, I didn't uh, get back to you. But, uh, well, we had to go with it another way. And uh, ah! and you know the story. Well, well what, what happened in Chicago? Fill me in. You tell me, the loop. You had oh, to deal oh, with the same. Well, that was the game, you know. And you knew that was, a, you know, I, I, I figured when they told me about it, that this is going to be uh, fun just to go do. Yeah, and there I am. And that is me. That's the true me in meditation ascending. But so, the, um, but so Shadow, there was I a promotion a, gig, and they knew they were going to hire you. You're a legend. I had, uh, I, have a, I had David Lynch on my show. Um, and he, not your best picture there. He, he yeah, talked, he did. talked, him, he talked me into doing meditation. Yeah. And I was set up to meet with the Maharishi, whoever, whoever the guy was that met with the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, Maharishi so, Mahesh. In Chicago, at a hotel room, and it was twenty five hundred dollars. And I said, eh, okay, wow. And they said, no, no, we have to put a value on it, or no, it doesn't mean anything. And I said, fine, twenty five hundred dollars, not a big deal. And I would do a week with the Maharishi, and I would bring fruit and flowers to the gods, which seemed pagan to me. I didn't like that. Whatever. But I was I was told that when the monkeys did it, the Beatles and everybody did it in the 60s, it took a long time to, to, to meditate for them to get it. And that our consciousness has vibrated higher. Look, I don't know what I'm just talking gibberish mostly, but that we actually are able to do it easier now than people in the 60s because things have changed in the in the universe. So it came to me very easily, and uh, and I'm a big believer in meditation. I have a very noisy mind, and uh, I think a lot of people right now, everything is fear-based, your news, your entertainment, everything is fear. Yep. And if you can meditate, folks, and clear your mind, um, and I believe in prayer as well, uh, to quiet your mind, and, and then what comes in is beautiful. Yeah, well, I, I, I totally agree. I, I uh, started doing Transcendental Meditation uh, in 1969 because of wow. the Beatles and then learned deeper kinds of meditations over the decades. I haven't basically stopped meditating for decades. Um, but I've, I do the same thing, you know, I, and I, I still meditate and I, and I teach. I do sessions with a, uh, a, a company in Santa Monica that does... Uh, it helps people with mental issues and getting off drugs and alcohol. And um, and part of it is mindfulness and guided meditation and true meditation, which is what you're talking about, which is focused. And um, and totally believe in that. So I'm, you know, very faith-based oriented person. 
And that's why I cre created Metal Radio, like you were saying. We're in a pandemic, we're in a lockdown. Dread, gloom, pessimism, and fear is spreading all over the world. What can I do that, uh, that isn't um, gooey, you know? Yeah. Optimism. What is it? Optimism. You know, it, opti people look, and that's the thing. People look at optimism as um, as something that uh, they have to be cynical about. It's like it's unrealistic or corny, or for those with no aptitude for critical thinking. You know, those, you know the intellectuals. And how you know what could I do that that would create an uplifting sense and a positive mindset without crystals, incense, beads, pyramids, turbans, and sitting in lotus. <laughs> And so I, I realized it was through storytelling. And so I started doing this uh, metal radio project in lockdown by myself in the studio. And How can I hear it? Hmm? How can, can I hear it? it? You can go to mentalradio.net. Mentalradio.net. Yeah, one word mental radio, okay. or you can get a free app. The app is everywhere. It's in for both Android uh, yeah. and um, uh, Apple. And it's, I poured myself into it. It's. What you were talking about, Stan Freeberg, it's total immersion audio. There it is. Mentalradio.com. Funny. Shadow, um, know. you know, uh, The Power of the Subconscious Mind. Did you read that book? It's one of my Bibles. And of course, you know, look, you can either go, you, you brains go one of two ways, right? So you either go negative or positive. Right. And you can certainly, you you get so much negative from the media and uh, but you can rewire your brain and you can do it through the subconscious mind. I have the book here behind me. I could show it, but whatever. Would you would you grab the power of the subconscious mind? You won't be on. Don't worry. It's right. In, it's right there. The lower shelf, I believe. But but um, uh, yeah, look, you you choose. You choose. Right. New levels, new devils. But, you know, you can choose new angels, too. And um, I saw Genesis last night and they were fantastic. Do you ever have a run in with them? I never did. I um, I always enjoyed them, but um, never got passionate you, about them. You interviewed everybody, so that so let's get. I want to be a little bit. A I want to be a little bit fanboy because I am a big fan of yours. Who who did you dig on? What bands? My favorite. My favorite story is um, I was on the air at KMET. I was program director, and and we were doing an afternoon show, and it was Brother John and I. Brother John is this legendary big voice, the voice of God. Yeah, and he could ad lib. He could improvise better than anybody. And it was Shakespeare's birthday, and we, we were doing mock Shakespearean, you know, will for thou out art, you know. And it was really funny, and it was one of those days where everything clicked. And I'm in there in this little studio, which was about the size of a closet, because you know, radio never put any money into buying actual studios. They would just put you wherever they could. And there's a knock on the door. Now, the door is locked because I've been smoking a lot of weed and, and ah! having a great old time. And when I still did that. And um, the knock on the door. So I go to the door and I open up the door and it's David Bowie. And David Bowie and a friend. And they said, I we just had to come and see where all this madness was coming from. Now, I'm wasted. I'm going, whoa, whoa, well, uh, so come in, come in. Uh you want to go on the air? Do you want to be interviewed? Do you want to uh, take over? You know, you can take over and like do all Bowie radio, whatever you want. Uh, and I wasn't prepared because I was so blown away by one of my favorite artists in the world. David Bowie was there and he liked what I was doing. And it was funny. He said, I brought you this gift. And he handed me this gift. And it was this little package. And I open up the package and it's a book with a felt cover, a handmade cover. And it says, to shadow from Bowie, the complete works of Shakespeare. And I opened it up and it was the works of Chairman Mao. <laughs> I thought, that's the greatest joke I've ever seen in my life. And I still have that book. It should be under glass behind, you know, ropes, you know, in a special place in a, in a major building. But uh, then later he gave me, um, and you can't see them, but they're this gold record that had a, a bunch of his uh, songs on it. It's dedicated from him. But the David Bowie interview is the all-time great of, I think, probably of my life. Besides Stan Freeberg, I, I interviewed Stan Freeberg on a radio show a few years ago. And and we reproduced that, uh, the Maraschino Cherry Drop. Yes, in the Lake Michigan. In the Lake Michigan. Yeah. yeah. So great. No, well, you know, Shadow, that was that was my, you saw, you could see it on the radio. 
a totally. trout smoking a pipe, a rhinoceros in the glove box. So I met I met Stan Freeberg. It was set up by a writer I believe named Robert Feeder, local radio writer, and uh, I got to meet I got to meet him. And uh, I tell him this story, and I'm almost teary eyed. And he hands me his book, his biography, and he says, uh, "That's twenty five dollars." Really? And I laughed. He goes, "No, no, <laughs> it's twenty five dollars." Does anybody? That's it. And and I, I think he was more interested in selling a book than 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 meeting me. But that's okay. Um, in L.A. was uh, look, I I didn't you know I didn't I didn't live in the East Coast. I lived in Kansas City. Uh, you know, we had we had. Uh, who, you know, Dick Wilson and Randy Miller, people like that that I would hear. Uh, Dick and Jay, uh, you, you you probably don't know any of these names. No, I don't know. Them. But but you guys had certainly. Uh, I became aware of. Um, oh my God, what are their names? Um, no, but wait, did you grow up in Kansas? In Kansas, Kansas City. Then did you listen to KOMA in Oklahoma? Never. Oh, really? was that you? Yeah. Well, no, I was in North Dakota. We I would I would get WLS. WLS. We, we, hilarious. we heated by wood and I had a transistor and I could get Fred Winston and I did hear him and I heard the doors for the first time out of uh, Chicago riders on the storm and my mind was blown. Yeah. yeah. But um, no, who, Dick who Biondi, was Dick Biondi on then? I never heard him. I mean, I, I got to know him. And of course the last 10 years, anytime I run into him, man, Cal, did I ever tell you I met the Beatles? He's, he's, you know, he's losing it, but I mean, a freaking legend and I respect the guy and he's been yeah. nothing but wonderful to me. So I sound like a real jerk, but, um, uh, Mark and Brian, of course, were you, were, did, were they good? Good guys. Yeah. Real yeah. Good. And then who, who, who were the most recent, uh, alternative guys? One guy moved to another. Kevin and Bean. Yeah. So yeah. look, I know, I know there's, there's nothing I would like more than to sit and talk about other radio shows with you. I know you're in hell. So you can you can keep the fake smile. I know you're humoring humoring me. The audience doesn't know how you're humoring me. You hate all these people because they take food out of your pot. They take food out of your mouth and money. Well, from I got kids. over there a long time ago. I went I, like but, I said, but, I'm going to work this hard. I'm going to go for. But I want to make I want to make a point about Kevin and Bean. Is they were just joyless. Mm. I, I I met them and they're miserable. I I was never miserable. How people are miserable. I, I you know I wrote a um a screenplay of, about that very idea that. You know, they got the happiest place in the world. We're in Los Angeles with the greatest, happiest music of all time. The sky is blue. The ocean is there. And these guys have the greatest job in history. And they they go in. And once they've got number one, they oh. are entitled. And I, I met those happy. I met those two. And they, and they hated each other. I'll tell you another, another story. I don't know. But Rick Dees, I was one of his head writers. Really? And, and, and he used a lot of my stuff. And he would sign every check, your fan, Rick Dees. And I knew Disco Duck as a kid, and I knew Rick Dees. I never heard his show, um, but I would write for him from Chicago and Kansas City and San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose as I traveled around doing my, my stupid radio show. And he would, and I met him a hundred times, and it always went like this. May I do it for you? Sure. Mm. Oh, you, oh, you're one of the, you're one of the greats. Oh, God, I... I love you. I, yeah, no, what's no. my name, Rick? <laughs> oh, you, you. Hey, look, look. If you made a hundred million dollars and owned a county in Kentucky with your own golf course and indoor basketball court and a house in Los Angeles and God knows what else, his own studio, it goes on and on and on. You'd probably be different too. Yeah. But and, and then the thing I love, he's a good guy. I did a tribute to him. He I got a, 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 um, a Boy Scout, Boy Scouts of America award a year, I, two years ago. I like him, I like him, but you know, and, 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 man, yes, of course. Man, oh, and then, <laughs> no, and then, I know it's classic. And then you shake his hand, and he has an assistant to immediately wash his hands. He does not <laughs> like touching people. Oh, God, I, I love you. I, Get the filth off me. I, I have a, uh, I have a, I have, do you like radio stories? Can I tell you another one? Sure. So I'm, I'm doing a radio show in Kansas City. I get asked to go um, uh, work with Scott Shannon. Yeah. Scott Shannon would call, hey man, what are you doing? Hey man. And I'd say what I'm doing, that's horrible. And I'd hear him typing, clickety click, click. Man, I, you did what? That's outrageous. And then he would do it the next day in New York. <laughs> it's, it's fine. So he called me. He wanted me to work with him. So I go to Madison Square Garden. 
I step, I have to step over homeless people. It's filthy. Uh, it's, it's, it's right after Pee Wee, the mass, this goes back, right? It's right after Pee Wee masturbation. Oh yeah. And, and he puts his arm around me and he says, Madison, Squ Madison Square Garden. You have made it, son. You have you made it. And I said, and I love Scott. I said, Scott, I don't want to do it. And what happened is I had the first interview with Pee Wee because I'd had a good relationship with Paul Rubens after mm -hmm. the masturbation incident. It would have been his first interview. And he had 20 people around a table. I never had any writers. You know, the other thing is Stern had 39 writers and he wore the glasses so he could read everything that was written. It was all scripted. My shit wasn't scripted. I could kick his ass, you know, mentally, he couldn't beat me. Of course, he would control the mic. If you control the mic, you win, right? You just turn me off. But sure. I never was. Anyway, uh, the point is, um, I'm a I fan. Of you. To tell you. I'll, I'll interrupt you long enough to say I'm a fan. I'm a fan of you and I'm a fan of Howard. I think Howard. Yeah, you're just because you're afraid. I'm not afraid. I have nothing left to be afraid of. Believe I, me. I, I'd be okay if he ate the, a bullet, but whatever. Ooh, he, he said horrible things about my father when he died of cancer. Some, you know, $30,000 a year puke. During his angry years. making Yeah, making kitchen cabinets in Kansas City and, you know, saying he was going to rape the corpse. And, oh, you know, yeah. He I, was a mess. He was a mess back in the day. I, I, well, I, I'm still waiting for my apology. Until that time comes, he can eat a bullet. But okay. anyway, I had Pee Wee coming on. Oh, my God. I'm, uh, this is in New York. I got Paul Rubens coming on. And the first guy goes, eh, pretty good. The next guy, eh. And then by the time it got around the table, the, the circle – of Shannon, they all vote, you know, they, nah, I don't think so. We don't need it. We, are you out of your minds? And he, oh, man, I don't think we should do it. They, they don't, nobody wants to do it. And I went, I cannot do this every day. They, they were mm. threatened. They didn't mm. want me there. They didn't want another chucklehead. Mm. And you can't do comedy by committee. Yeah. 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 You can't, you have to have uh, control of, and then I found that more and more as I went on, you know, trying to work with people and and get used to all their quirks and anger and entitlement and and uh, wanting to take control and grandstand and so I'll just do it on my own. But you were just talking about me. Yeah, no, I, I'm talking about not just radio people. I mean, this happened many times in television as well. It's people are weird. You got you. Know, I've been really lucky to have a few periods of my life where I had really fabulous people. I. You know, when I did the Federated Group, I had this little team of a, like a Monty Python team. And it was me and six guys. And we did everything. We wrote them. We shot them. We edited. We did the post-production. We cranked them out six or eight commercials a week because no commercial ever went longer than 10 days. And they were all funny. And they were all like because we had absolute control. And then when I did Dave's World with Harry Anderson and Meshach Taylor and... It was fabulous. Four years of really funny, great uh, shows and uh, great teamwork. Can I, will you be honest with me? Yeah. You're a program director. You've done that. You're the boss at radio stations. Yeah. You're a program director right now. Let's pretend. Okay. You're a program director. You're talking to me. What are your thoughts? And be honest. I think we have to rein you in. Uh, no. Well, that's what they always think. Of course. Of course they do. Because you're a wild man and can't be controlled and can't be trusted. Look at you. Okay. Look, Manco. <laughs> Got a few words with you. Can you sit a little closer? Um, we're going to have to let you go. Uh, you are always laughing, and I know you're cynical about what we're doing. I'm going to have to let you go. And I hope that with this last check, you go out and uh, spend it in the first two weeks and maybe you'll come to the meaning of life. What's the meaning of life, you're supposed to say? Question, what is the meaning of life? Management is God. They put the food in your mouth and the roof over your head. Management is God. No, but you, what What would What would you, would you want, would you want me as your, would you want me on your station? Yeah. Yeah, because because you're creative and, and, and enthusiastic and prepare. I worked with so many people who got cocky 
and didn't think they had to prepare. They thought they'd arrived and the people like me because of who I am and I can spontaneously spout wit and the greatest radio people I ever knew and in and, and all the other arts are all people that worked at it, who all prepared, who you know, spent time writing, spent time researching, read, you know, you got to read, you got to pay attention, you got to write and write and write and write. And when, and when you write and you walk in prepared, now you're calm. And when you're calm, you can, there you go. When you're calm, you can then be spontaneous because you know I've got something to fall back on. I know what my structure is. I know what I can do. And that's what I always try to impart to people. And the really good ones always did that. And the other ones got very important. I started in 1984. I got up every day at 2.30. Uh, I quit the end of last year. I was exhausted. Uh, I, I spent all of that time exhausted. You can never... They say you get used to it. You don't get used to it. I still had to get up at 2.30 and dinner still happened at 8 and movies and concerts you had to go to or books you had to read. And uh, and I and I and it did not come easy for me. And I did not waltz through a show. I, I did work on every show. And um, and I'm proud of that. But, I, I, you know, it was certainly the last two years, three years maybe, was running face first into a brick wall. Um, and, you know, real, real moronic. And, and, and you know the woman... Because you dealt with her, and I don't want to mention her name, but you know, uh, just we had um, we had T-shirts. That's all we had. We had um, a medium T-shirt. <laughs> a medium. We had one medium T-shirt. I don't know if I want to mention the station, but you know, you know the lady I'm talking about. And I said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. We got one medium t-shirt. Now I've met you people. Most of you are big. I'm a two XL. I don't want to hear any complaining. We're not, we don't have another shirt for you. We have a medium. Don't play the stupid contest. Now you can give it to your girlfriend. She's probably skinnier than your wife who can't fit. Nice yeah. And I go to commercial cow. Oh, what have you done? I, I, I'm going to have to teach you theater of mind. You know, you could have you could have made it sound great. Theater of mind. Did you not hear what I just did? I made a medium T-shirt interesting, you twit. <laughs> God. Were yeah, you, you, can't, uh, you can't make this stuff up. Q104, I came in on the end of piles of cocaine. I came in on the end of that. I did see, and I was a nobody, but I did see envelopes filled with money for, for songs to get played. I certainly saw a little bit of that in San Francisco at a station called Wild 107. Actually, it may have been k sold at the time. You've been in it a few years longer than me. Were, did you go through the coke and the party phase? Must have been fun. Well, yeah, there is there is a uh, fun phase, and then there is a chasing the fun phase, and then the chasing the fun phase that leads into oblivion. And then it, I, I became a, a, a hardcore drug addict. I, I was... What? Yeah, it, got, it got real bad. What? Uh, I, how I lived, I don't know. I used into convulsions and I would hit my head <laughs> on the floor as my body rocked. And I also had gained 50 pounds because I didn't stop eating either. So I'm doing massive amounts of cocaine and crystal meth and two and all and, and Librium and Valium and you know, uh, quaaludes and anything that would, else that would take off the edge and drinking, you know, a quarter Canadian club a day and and wine and after after drinks and crevassier and tequila and anything anybody put in front of me at any time. And I, um, after, min after months of using into convulsions, I went to a doctor and the doctor said, after my physical, if you're lucky, you're going to die. I don't think you're going to get out that lucky. You're going to have a stroke or a heart attack any minute. You're so full of toxins. You've got to stop. And I couldn't. And I kept using until I had an overdose in my studio. And my friends found me at four in the morning. And I went into rehab. And it changed my life. And that was 37 years ago. So all the stuff, Hollywood Squares and all the movies and all the series and all the things I've been able to do all happened post-drug addiction. Shocking, isn't it? Yeah, I had no idea. I thought you were kidding. At one point, you were naming everything. So you were you enjoyed it all. 
I, I overdid it all. I did massive. I stayed on acid for a, a, a week in, Mau in Maui. And every time I came down, I would have another spoonful just to kick it up a bit and wear one-way shades so that I could tell the story of myself to myself as I did things in order to not go into panic. So he, our hero stepped up to the cashier who turned a brighter shade of purple. And he tried to pay the, the couple of dollars that it would take to get the snorkel. And he paid it and everything was good as he walked out to his car. I actually did that. <laughs> you, you, you were doing it live. Yeah, in my head, it was all live. You know, it was like a narrative, you know, a narration from a script from a higher power. We're just going to get you through this, kid. What's what's the um, what's the greatest radio show you ever heard? The greatest moment? Greatest moment in radio. Oh, Jesus. I... Do you want me to tell you? Yeah, please. You had and I had and everybody had. Do you remember the color coded records, the sound effect albums? Sure. With a million one second cuts yeah yeah every radio station had this catalog of sound effects and you heard them on everything you heard them, but you heard them on tv as well and i'm listening to art bell and he says a art bell was an overnight show you know what i'm talking you know what i'm talking about yeah of course yeah and he um, goes there's a hole that is developed behind my trailer in perump and all night long, and I was riveted, we need another mile of cable. Now, a mile of cable is insane. But all night long, and you would hear the mic, and it was obviously the mic in a glass. It's hitting the rocks as it's descending. Best radio I ever heard. So this goes on for, for however his show is. Fantastic. We need another mile. And they're lowering the mic. And you hear, are you ready? And you'll know the sound effect. Shadow, are you ready? Yeah. Do <laughs> you remember that cut? <laughs> yes. And Art says, my God, we're listening to the sounds of hell. <laughs> yes! I love Art Bell even more now that I've heard that story. That's oh, fantastic. he was you know, so full of shit. And the great ones are. I mean, you know, Alex Jones. I'll, I'll, tell, uh, you I'll tell you uh, one. Bill Hendry. Phil Hendry is one of my favorite personalities of all time. Is he alive? He's alive and he has the most beautiful voice you ever heard. And he does all kinds of voice work and he acts. And But he did. And look him up on YouTube. And you can see him live. Do I it. know him. Okay. He, for people that don't know him, he is the host. And then he would say the story. And then and he would uh, interview someone. And he would then take calls from male and female listeners and it would the greatest show i ever heard he was doing uh, he was interviewing a guy who had a book about how women loved him how he was the the the, ah. the women god and he and his secret and he was spanish and he was it was something like la, 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 la. it was like something really stupid like that and then he would take a call from people and they would be outraged and some people would love him i just love him it they i love this book and he teaches you how to treat women and how to how to how to love women and and he was all of them he was the callers he was the female callers and all live unscripted it's you know so many personalities yeah. going on in his head and he would interrupt himself and he would talk into the phone and he would talk into the microphone and he would talk into the phone and sometimes two phones and have different sounds and yeah i've never seen anything like it he's an absolute genius who was the greatest entertainer that ever lived Oh God, that's too hard for me. I can't do that. No, Douglas Fairbanks. Senior. Greatest. I mean, you guys got. I mean, did you? You were part of some of those huge concerts in L.A. Do you? Do you have one that sticks out? Did you know my friend Vaughn Freeman? No. Produced one know. of those big shows. Did oh, uh, you mean uh, concerts? Yeah. You uh, know yeah. the um. What what were the, not the Weenie Rose, but what were the big Kiss shows? Oh. oh they before, still have them. Yeah, before it became Heart. I heart. Yeah. They still do them. You know, now they're the I heart fest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really don't. I was so out of radio by that time with it. That's yeah. that, that hit. I was doing um, American top 40, but I, you know, I would just visit the stations and be flown around to, um, to talk about stuff. But I, I can't listen to radio. Can you listen to radio? No, I, I listen to Howard Stern. Yeah. I like, I hate, I hate you saying that. I know you do, but he's awfully good. 
I can't. I, I can't. I just stand. and, and I just saw his movie uh, yesterday. It was on as I walked through the room, and I couldn't stop watching. It was like because it's just like what you and I went through. You know, the stuff with pig vomit and that stuff. We all I'll work never, for a guy like that. I'll never see it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll never pretty, see it. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I know. I can understand, and my heart goes out to you, but I'm still a fan. Uh, and he's the only one, though. I don't listen to any radio. I, li I listen to Planet Pootweidle on the internet, which was started by um, by um, a friend of mine who is a programmer in L.A. And just he says, this is what I want to do, and I'm doing it for me. And it's about eight stations in one. He has the greatest taste of anyone, of music taste of anybody I've ever known. I, I have never listened for more than 20 minutes and not heard something I'd never heard before that I absolutely love. And it goes all over the place. It could be yeah. blues and it could be rock and it could be classic rock and it could be pop music that's up now or 1930s music. It's just the, he has one of the biggest music libraries I've ever seen in my life. You, you, uh, yeah. You know, what I tell people is you listen to the angry person on the radio and they're not angry and it's fake because they can never say anything against the agenda of the corporations. Right. And of course, I take it further, and I believe it's all Chinese controlled. You don't have to comment, uh, my opinion. And so them. I hear these angry guys, and we got it. And I know it's fake because I was in that world. Sure. And then you hear the laugh, and or you have oh, eight fifteen, oh, and it's it's shit. <laughs> so I they have been really worth listening to for a long time. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's poor Waddle. There's Poot Waddle, yeah. Poot Waddle is fun. Poot Waddle, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it's stone it's on my screen. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's um, what do they call it? The magic brownie of the airwaves. It's stoner. It's a stoner station. Uh, any 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 advice, or what's the best advice you ever got? Uh, the only important thing I've discovered in life is meditating, and I'm glad that you and I have that in common. Um, yeah because I believe you have to get behind the mind in order to not be subject to how insane it is. The why me's and the oh no's and the yeah buts and the what abouts and the what abouts and what if you, and what if, what if you're too old? What if you don't understand? What if you're not smart enough? What if you're not good enough? What if you don't, it's like, shut up, you know, in the backseat. I got stuff to do. You got to keep, and I, and I, and I became a fan of Victor Frankl. Do you know the Victor Frankl story? No. Victor Frankl was a psychologist, um, and a doctor who was about to to uh, publish his life's work in in Vienna when the Nazis invaded, and they took him away to a concentration camp. And he he was so afraid that he would lose his his life's work, he sewed the book into his coat. And of course, they took his clothes and burned it. And then they gave him the clothes of a man who had been to the gas chamber, and in it was one Jewish prayer, and. That some, it sparked something in him, and he realized that the people around him who were dying were not the ones necessarily taken off to be, you know, into the crem crematorium. It, it were, they were people who lost a purpose for life, you know, meaning. And he realized for himself, I've got to try and write my manuscript. And he started writing notes on little scribbles of paper and hiding them. And he did that through four concentration camps. And when he got done, they were liberated. And he wrote the book in nine days. And it sold 12 million copies and was translated into 24 languages. It was one of the most profound books you ever wrote, re read in your life. Say, going I, to be I, called Choose Life in Spite of Everything. And he you called know, it Shadow, search, uh, Shadow, what's it called? Man's Search for Meaning. You know, I, I, I have read that. Um, yeah, and he talks about tragic optimism. Optimism in the face of all evidence to the contrary. It's, yeah. it's, it's why, you know, and I had him play my wedding. It's why I think I love the music of the kinks. I the Greek, love the, Greek. the kinks. One well, of my it, favorite groups of all time. But you know, it's, it's, you want the girl, but then the chorus is you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You don't have enough money. Right. And, and, you know, uh, I, I guess Dexter's back on TV and he talks about the chattering companion, but we all have that. Yeah, and our, our mind, you know, when our mind whisper of emotion, it says, hey, how you doing today? Not so good, huh? Yeah. You know why? Because you suck. Here's why. 
and it tells you all your failures and all your setbacks and all the people that ever hurt you and all your resentments and it builds a narrative that you follow and you go yeah he's right he's right he knows the real me he sees the truth i have a character in um in metal radio called brock stillwell square jawed jackhammer of a man in a plaid shirt it can only mean one thing he comes to save the day and he dives into a shark tank to rescue a girl and the shark bites him and he turns and laughs and the shark seeing his dazzling smile is suddenly ashamed you hear the inner voice going i've never been a good shark <laughs> everybody can see the real me even the even the plankton mock me why can't i be happy like the clams Brock what, what are you talking about rock stillwell metal radio metal radio is full of stuff like that is that what you're doing that's what i'm doing metal radio is is it's i guarantee you've never heard anything like it you okay. listen with earphones and it moves around in your head I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna find it and i have a few radio ideas that i'll never do is that i'll never do i don't think but uh listen uh shadow uh, i wanted to make a point yeah you are not your mind yep and when you realize that and i and i let me just you got it and I, I never think of myself as smarter than, well, a lot of cases I have been smarter than some of the morons that call up. But um, it's very hard for people to understand. And look, I get up in the morning and your brain is warming up and it goes bing, 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 bing. And it'll take you on flights of fancy with a bunch of shit that you don't care about and a bunch of fears that, you sh that don't matter. The past is written. The future will take care of itself. All you have is now. It's a present. That's why it's called the present. Yeah. And then, of course, and the Bible talks about it, right? So it happens when you get up in the morning mm -hmm. and it happens as you go to bed. The lion roars in the morning and at night. And if you that's not you, you are. And if you can separate your mind from you, your soul, your spirit, your body, you're. You're so much more than this. Take control. Carry away. Yeah. Use and, it. Use it. And, you know, maybe when we were out in the I don't know if we were ever with dinosaurs but maybe oh uh, uh, saber tooth tiger we got uh, tr trouble there uh, what uh, you know right. we don't need that anymore we've evolved past that yeah the brain is not my friend it's trying to kill me so through meditation yes old resentments old you know let it go let it it's that cowboy mouse song let it go 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 and you're not your mind if you don't meditate try it is there a book that you like on meditation uh, you know, there's a lot of them. Um, yeah. I read like eight minute, eight minute meditation. Yeah. And it was simple. And it's easy. It's easy. Sure. Yeah. Well, there are, there are a lot of different ways to go. I mean, if you like transcendental meditation, it's perfectly good. It's, it's, I did it for about three years. Um, I wanted something deeper and more personal and, and there are ways to find that. I think that, that what it is, is, is let curiosity lead you. If you want to know about it, ask, look into it, you know, read something. If you don't like it, read something else. You know, uh, Deepak Chopra has got lots of stuff. Maybe that's not for you, but. Uh, not for me. Have yeah, you met Deepak? I, no, I haven't met him. No. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the problem. And that's the problem. I have, I have a bit about that, too, about the guru. I, and, and, and the faith and the faith healer, you know, the, the faith ministers. There, there's, uh, you know, there's there's so many different people like that that you know did you like eckhart Tolle, the power of now i did like it i did I like recommend it. that eckhart Tolle. i, I absolutely did too and again you know just because i mentioned this or shadow mentions i mean we like everything about it and it's our you know there this is made up of a lot of yeah there's gems in, there's real gems that will speak to you they're, they're were you were you, a, you know you're a big radio star were you a, in la were you a playboy mansion guy no, I, my children grew up with his children um, during his married phase. Kimberly. Yeah, with Kimberly. And um, and we were invited there all the time. And I never enjoyed it. I was always like, this is creepy. And and the kids would go because the grounds are phenomenal. Uh, you know, it's really, they, they were having a great time. There were the other kids. And we're there like, like, I've never, so finally, like it might've been years that we'd been going there all the time. I'm finally there to pick up China, my daughter. And, um, and Hugh is there. 
and he's walking by and I say, you know, you know, we've never actually met, but I'm China's father and uh, my name is Shadow Stevens. And he looked at me and went charmed and turned and walked away. I went, okay, you're a dick. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what? Kind, kind of like the meeting I had with the head of Slipknot recently, but that's another story. <laughs> um, for, for, for me, and I, my friend Kevin Burns did Girls Next Door and so, you know, half always looked like he had chiclets in his mouth and man cow. And they did silent movie night. And I yeah. went to, and I like silent movies. And I have to I tell do. you, there's nothing more that 18 and 19 year old nude models want than to sit with a 90 year old man and watch silent movies. Oh boy. And and they they were I loved it. They were bored out of their mind. Um I, I and I, I look the the house smelled of smelled like old man piss mm -hmm. i mean you know whatever vision i had of the and, and he was very nice to me and the girls next door were nice to me and but it was a creepy old guy's house and pretty and, creepy. Pretty and, creepy. and you know my understanding was and i don't know this but my understanding was that you know he liked to watch them and he um and you know the 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 grotto, the famous grotto was right. it's smelly and smelled like body odor and bleach to cover the body odor. And am I am I nailing it pretty? And he was very proud of the fact that John Lennon put a cigarette out on his Monet or whatever it was. All right, come on, I'll show you the. I had um, his daughter's name. Uh, what what was her name? The daughter, uh, the old daughter. I, I don't remember. I, I actually she. Don't. Um, she torn to me one night and uh, she said uh, it was an actor that was not Peter Dinklage in, in A Night in Bruges was the movie. Hmm. She goes, that's Peter Dinklage, the finest diminutive actor on earth. I said, that's not Peter Dinklage. Oh, shock jock, do you want to challenge me in front of my father? All right, mother, $5,000, $10,000. Come on, loud mouth. I'm like, chill. Well. And, and Hef goes, <laughs> Hef goes, you know, like, what was her name? She ran, she, in my opinion, ran Playboy into the ground. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I don't remember her name. I, I don't uh, know that I ever met her. Yes, what a, what a, what a delight. Good work, huh? uh, One of God's Christy, children. Christy, Christy Hefner. Yeah, Christy oh, Hefner. Right. Thank you, Bill, Bill Glegoroff. Yeah. Christy Hefner. Yeah. Um, but, but I'll tell you what, and you, this, these are names uh, only you, I doubt anyone will know. But when I got to sit there and I'm watching a face in the crowd, you ever see that silent movie? Yeah. You know, that was the basis. I love silent movies. I spent, um, since 1976, I've worked on my favorite movie of all time is probably the silent version of Thief of Baghdad with Douglas Fairbanks. I think it's magical. And I, and I worked at putting together a contemporary soundtrack that would do justice to the film. And my son grew up with me doing it. And it's still a passion of ours. And we've done probably 50 or 60 iterations of the whole the whole movie. And and spoke with, um, with it ended up being, it's all uh, the Electric Light Orchestra, ELO. And um, that's what we ended up doing about, starting about 20 years ago. Can I get it? Um, I could share it with you. But I have it isn't public because I don't know the music. Metropolis, I I've done it at film festivals and got standing ovations and and rave reviews. Uh, but I could never get it off the ground. I always wanted to to um, uh, bring it to life and make a contemporary film. You know, like um, colorize it in the in the in the uh, palette of uh, Maxfield Parish. You know, it, I love and, him. And I, and I hired a company in India to do the trailer, and it's gorgeous and it would be amazing and when you see in the last version my son was really responsible for it because he just carried it and says i love this and it's like what i like to do most in life it has 150 different songs or pieces of songs or sounds from all of jeff lynn's library uh in two and a half in a two and a half hour movie it all matched to the scenes and segued as if they're performing it live. It's really remarkable. Couldn't, couldn't you go to TCM and pitch them this? 
I don't know. You know, I, I, we've wondered about what to do with it. I was dealing with Jeff Lynn's manager for a lot of years. Jeff came to my house um, 20 years ago and saw a version, watched it on VHS. And? and he goes, oh, my God. He said, you know, it's as if the music was written for the film. It's absolutely astonishing. So I've been talking with his manager, and they and they put me with uh, publishing at Sony, and I talked to her, and they watched it, and they said, well, we don't know what to do with it, but it really is special, and we could never find funding or never find a way to, uh, to get it off the ground. Uh, this United Center show a year or two ago with the yellow, people are still talking about. I mean... Uh, one of the great concerts of all time. The one at the Hollywood Bowl is one of my favorite concerts of my whole life. For me, it was Pink Floyd, 86, Checker Dome, St. Oh, Louis. Yeah, yeah well, hey. Shadow, well, um, like I, like I, well, I was going to say, uh, you know, with, sitting at Hef's house, there he is, sitting at Hef's house with Chuck McCann and... Um, oh, Chuck, I love Chuck. You know, and, and the great, the, you know, and... and uh, oh, you know, Anne Margaret and um, the... Who was the guy that was in The Greatest American Hero? Not William Catt, but the FBI agent. Culp. Oh, Robert Culp. Robert Culp and Larry Storch. Oh, geez. That's one night. Whoa. So it was creepy. It smelled like old guy piss. Shadow <laughs> was, was dropping off his daughter out front. I mean, you know. It smelled I like something. I love the menagerie in the backyard of, of Hef's place. <laughs> Very what, um, where are we headed? You, you, you know, you, you're a free speech guy. I'm a free speech guy. Uh, I, 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 I like to be optimistic. Um, will radio ever come back? Will anybody wake up and try to do something creative? My friend Lee Abrams and others have talked about it. Yeah. I don't know. I think that people have moved on. I, I know my children don't listen to anything. Uh, they listen to podcasts um, or stuff that they find on um, online. The radio is, you know, it was the, the social media of, of our generation. It was the place where you go to hear about movies and about music and about everything that was exciting. And there weren't a lot. Now there's a billion options. So now in the billion options, we've got to carve out places for ourselves and how to make it really compelling and interesting and entertaining and unusual that people will gravitate toward. So that's why, I mean, that's the, besides wanting to create something that was optimistic, why I created mental radio. And we've actually, Six months in, Vin DeBona, the guy who created America's Funniest Videos, called me and he said, I love everything you're doing. It's like Orson Welles in the wow. 1940s where, he, you know, the Mercury Theater. He said, we've got to do a TV version. And so we've been working for nine months creating the TV version of Mental Radio. And we finished last week and we had his first meeting yesterday and the, and the head of the network went crazy for it. So maybe there's hope. I don't know. Craig Ferguson said it's Flash Gordon, L. Ron Hubbard, Captain Marvel, Buckaroo Banzai, and everything else. The production, everything. I really like it. It's really amazing. So I highly recommend Metal Radio. I, boy, that's a lovely guy, isn't it? I, I did his show numerous times. I don't think I was a big enough name. I, I talk to him every week. We have, we have meetings every week to this day. He's in Scotland in a Will castle. You Will you please tell him, he was on my show a lot and I did his TV show. Please tell uh, Craig, I, I said hi and I love him and and um, and I love you. And I, you know, look, anyone that inspires us, you know, look, if you want to sell something, you have to get to somebody before the age of cynicism. Right. The little kid in the toy BMW, BMW hated it. The baby in the crib with the Maxwell house, smelling the coffee. We're not selling to babies. We're not selling cars to five-year-olders. No, their sales skyrocketed. The fact is, I remember sitting, I was standing, helping him up to the urinal, Mickey Rooney, put his hand against the wall at, w, at the studios of WLS across from the Chicago Theater back in the old days, and he goes, Kim Kardashian's not a star. I knew Judy Garland. I knew Liz Taylor, man, those were stars. Yeah. So I tell you, Eric Ferguson, who just ruined his career, that's not a star. Shadows... Stern's not a star. Rush is, I love Rush. He was a friend, but yeah. Shadow to me is a star. There he is, a bright, shiny star. And, you know, we love anyone that inspired us as, as, as children. And um, you did it. And thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you're, you. You're, you're a far more interesting guy than I thought you were going to be. 
Ah, well, thank you. I, I enjoyed it. I love your energy and your wit and your passion. Keep going. I had, um, I'm, I'm going to end. I, I met Orson Welles as a kid and he had leg braces on metal leg braces. He was so obese. Yeah. And I was really into radio and into doing radio shows, probably like you in my basement with my little Radio Shack tape player. And yeah, yeah. And my radio name was Bill Savage. And um, I met him and told him, and he said, you know, I have an original Mercury Theater script of War of the Worlds. Ooh. Would you like me to send that to you? And I said, oh, no, no, it's okay. Okay. And he walked on. And from that point on, probably worth, not, not, I wouldn't sell it, but probably worth a half a million dollars, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure. A War of the Worlds, Mercury. And, and now, whatever anybody offers, if I want it, I'd like to buy you. Let's go right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Take advantage of it. I had uh, Den the late Dennis Hoff on my show, and he's like, you need an iPad. And your daughters need American girls. You haven't gotten American Girl dolls. There's one right down the street. We're going to go right now. Nice. He said, I want to well, buy those. Let's go right now. Right now. So, you know, say yes. We're so used to saying no. Where are we headed to good things? You have good, you have high hopes. I mean, you part of pop pop culture. I was part of pop culture, not like you, but are we headed towards good things? Well, the, the whole center of metal radio is optimism. It's it the, the story is that they're uh, beginning with Nikola Tesla, there was a secret underground organization dedicated to uplifting mankind, and they that they have been in place for generations. They're called optimisticals, spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C-A-L-S. Optimisticals are among us, and I believe we are headed to better times. And you, there's no choice. You have no choice but to be optimistic. The end. You can't. The moment you let a dark thought in, it, it it's like we were talking about. It let it lets in, you know, yeah. the, the sewage. My dad was uh, mayor of Lakehurst, New Jersey, when the Hindenburg went down. Mm. Not not when the Hindenburg, where the Hindenburg went down, after the Hindenburg. Right. He knew the guy that was standing there with the hook. Mm. And um, I've got the newspapers. He did not want fluoride in the water. He did not believe in any chemicals. He wanted nothing added to the water. And uh, they physically chased him out of town like, we're going to kill you. The big business. We're going to put fluoride, which is a poison, in the water. Now, having said that, <laughs> I have to go to the dentist all the time, and my brothers and I have cavities. The other kids that got fluoride don't have cavities. Right, um, right. Yeah. I'm just saying that's a, But when he died, he left me these files. And I'm telling you that the Hindenburg was not an accident. Oh, really? And and um, Howard Hughes, I'll name one person. And the, the amount of names that are involved, you know, this was a giant advertisement for Adolf Hitler. Mm, no, I, I didn't know that. When, when no, I mean, when, when the Hindenburg went over. Oh yeah, oh yeah, because it was German. But I mean, the day turned to night. Mm. You know, kids were running down Atlantic City. You know, what is this? This thing was as big as a football field. Yeah, yeah. And it had that Nazi symbol. Right, that's right. That's right. I forgot. And uh, some very powerful people. Anyway, that's my book that I'm working on. Listen, I love you. I good. wish you all good things. Thank you for the inspiration. You do. Uh, what is it? It's late here. What time? It's like two o'clock in the afternoon in L.A., right? With the time change? Uh, yeah, no, it's six o'clock. Any movies, any TV shows you give a shit about? Yeah, yeah, I, there's a lot of them. I, you know, I can, you know, how, you want a list? I mean, right now I, I'm watching Succession with everybody else and The Morning Show. I, I like them both a lot. Uh, but there's, uh, there are some wonderful uh, foreign, there's uh, Lupin, L-U-P-I-N, the French um, series about the, uh, the James Bond of Thieves. And it's fabulous. It's What's beautiful. it called? L-U-P-I-N. Everybody here knows it but me. I, I like the new Bond movie. I thought the new Dune was not great, but I had a good time at it. And then yeah. I'm watching I'm watching Yellowstone, although they've added a kid. Mm. Uh, but Yellowstone and uh, and Dexter is back and uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. Well, there you go. You can't get better than that. That's well, there is some good stuff. Brother, yeah. good night. Thanks for your time. 
All right. Wait, wait. We just did the Illuminati symbol, and everybody's going to say, uh, it's yeah. an accident. We're good. Ah, no, ah. no, no, no. Play. Make them stop. Make them stop. Ah, they're part of it. Love you. Good night. Good night, everyone.